Sri Lanka's economic crisis is getting worse. Its president has yet again declared a state of emergency to deal with growing public anger. But what brought the nation to this unprecedented situation and what's the way out? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the programme. I'm Adrian Finnegan. The island nation of Sri Lanka is in crisis. There have been food and fuel shortages for weeks and power cuts have become the new norm. Many say they're struggling to get by and they blame the government for mishandling the economic situation, calling on President Gotabaya Rajapaksa to resign. There was a general strike on Friday that shut down much of the country. In response, the president's office reimposed a state of emergency, saying that it's needed to ensure public order. We'll bring in our guests in just a moment, but first a report from Al Jazeera's Manel Fernandez in Colombo. Police were among the few state employees working in Sri Lanka on Friday. They used water cannon and tear gas to disperse hundreds of protesters gathered at barricades sealing off the entrance to parliament. Inside the building in Sri Java, Dhanapura, opposition representatives marched into the speaker's office asking him to order the police to stop their operation. They also demanded he set a date for a no-confidence motion they're putting forward against the government. The government is under increasing pressure to resign, facing a second nationwide strike in eight days. Hospitals, railways, postal services, schools and ports were disrupted. Strictly, uh, this government and Gotabe Rajapaksa should be responsible for this failure in the Sri Lanka. Therefore, we don't believe they can develop this country uh, hereafter. Therefore, we are asking new government, new, uh, new leadership, uh, new system for Sri Lanka. That's why all the people uh, get together for one umbrella. Demonstrations and marches like this have been a common sight in the capital Colombo and around the country. In Chilau, on the northwestern coast, fishermen also took part in the protests. We have more than 15,000 fishing families in this area. We're all helpless. So we'll protest today, tomorrow and in the future. The government has admitted its foreign reserves have fallen to just 50 million US dollars, leaving it unable to buy essential food, medicine and fuel. Queues have stretched for kilometres around most petrol stations in recent days. After months of insisting it has things under control, the government has now approached the International Monetary Fund for a bailout. And President Gotabe Rajapaksa has replaced his cabinet as calls increased for him to step down. His new media minister told Al Jazeera Rajapaksa is making an effort and should be supported to bring stability. He got rid of some very powerful uh, people who were in the cabinet, some of, some of his own family members. Of, uh, five of them are out now. So with these radical changes, he are trying, he's making an effort. So I think um, we are trying to help him. Uh, he has given us a challenge. We are trying to face that challenge and find solutions to the people. Godeheva says the new team should be given six months to a year and a half before elections are held to decide a way forward. Trade unions say the last work stoppage of this scale was 69 years ago, but are warning they will launch an indefinite strike if the government does not heed demands for it to resign. Mina Fernandez, Al Jazeera, Colombo. All right, let's bring in our guests for today's discussion. In Colombo, we have Bhavani Fonseca, a senior researcher and attorney at law with the Centre for Policy Alternatives. From Bangkok, we're joined by Ahilan Karagama, who's a political economist and senior lecturer at the University of Jaffna. And also in Colombo, Jehan Pereira, Executive Director of the National Peace Council of Sri Lanka. A warm welcome to you all. Uh, Bhavani Fonseca, if we can start with you. So Sri Lanka's economy, as we heard, has gone into free fall. It's the worst financial crisis since independence in 1948. And the people seem to be putting the blame squarely at the feet of one man, President Rajapaksa Gotabaya. How on earth did Sri Lanka get into this mess? Well, thank you, Adrian, for having me on this show. It's a very timely discussion because we are in both a political and an economic crisis. Now, we've seen the warning signs for some time. There's been 
several uh, policy issues that were disastrous, the tax cuts, the fertilizer ban, and there was a lot of advice given to the government over the last one and a half to two years that the decisions being made and the mismanage was going to lead to some kind of crisis. But only a couple of weeks ago was this really realization by the government that we, we are in disaster zone. Um, and that's purely because the people took to the streets peacefully due to economic hardships. If you look at it, you have long lines to get essential items. Some items are not available, long power cuts. So for the last few weeks, people have been peacefully protesting. And as a result, in early April, there was mass resignation of the government and several other key individuals. And now we are having a crisis point where there is the continuous demand by the people for the president and the prime minister to resign. So regardless of the demands, they continue to hold office. Ahilan Karigama uh, in uh, Bangkok. The opposition and protesters are accusing the government of, quote, criminal financial mismanagement. Uh, are Sri Lanka's current woes, woes solely the, respon uh, the responsibility, the fault of, of the government, or are other factors at play here too? Yeah, by far this is the worst crisis Sri Lanka is going through since the 1930s. Um, we've been in a crisis trajectory for some time, uh, certainly over the last 12 years. But certainly when the uh, COVID pandemic hit two years ago, it was amply clear that um, we were going to go into balance of payment problems. And this government did absolutely nothing to address that. So that's why I think um, the, the blame has to be put squarely on this um, government. Um, even though this is a, 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 it's a crisis long in the making, um, there could have been many things done so that we don't reach uh, this sort of a, a, a point where people can't even get their uh, essential goods. And now the, the, the question is, how do we move from here? And from this crisis, which even the, the current finance minister says is going to take two more years, I think we are probably in a crisis for the next five years to a decade with a regime that has completely lost legitimacy. This government has no legitimacy among the people. It's not going to be able to lead the people out of this crisis. A crisis of this proportion, you need the state and society to work together. People have to be mobilized so that we can uh, start to rebuild our economy. And with a government that has completely lost legitimacy, because over the last two years, even as the situation was deteriorating, they did little. They gave little relief to the people. They did nothing in terms of uh, re uh, reducing our imports so that we could have saved some of our foreign exchange. So all of that is the reason why there is so much anger against this uh, government. And now, unless there is a complete change in the government from the president, the prime minister, the, the entire lot of them, and, and that's what the people are calling for, is going to be very hard to get out of this crisis. Jehan Pereira, um, this government may have lost legitimacy then, but would an opposition-led government fare any better at managing uh, the crisis than the incumbent government? I mean, by fixing this crisis, they'd have to inflict further economic pain on people. Would the people tolerate that? Or could a government led by the current opposition become just as unpopular... Uh, as the incumbent one, very quickly. Yeah, I'd like to add to uh, two uh, points to what Ahilan said earlier, and that relates to the, what the alleged criminal mismanagement by this government. And the, the two incidents that I'd like to talk about are the tax cuts that they immediately brought in as soon as the president was elected in November 2019. Now, Sri Lanka has historically, at least in the last... Uh, 10, 20 years, had low tax rates. The, the direct income tax is relatively low, and it has been more the value-added tax, the taxes, indirect taxes that affect the whole population that are a little higher. But in any event, our tax rates are very low. Now, the government came and slashed the existing tax rates by virtually half. As, and as a result, the tax revenues to the government came down. Now, the reason 
for it. They, the government stated that the reason is that they were going to give more incentives to people, to businesses to earn more and then develop the economy and provide employment. But also the reason was that they were facing a general election. After the presidential election, a few months later, there was going to be the general election. So it is very likely that the government cut the taxes in order to woo the people and get the vote. Then the second uh, absolutely inexplicable decision taken by the government was the president, in fact, to, uh, to overnight, they banned, banned the use of chemical fertilizers and went into organic farming overnight. It's impossible. No country in the world goes into organic farming 100%. Uh, at best, uh, developed countries like Germany have maybe 10 to 15 percent organic farming. Here we went 100 percent, right. all our land, into organic farming. Disaster. And that's when the first protests came about. Now, the opposition, if if they take over, of course, they don't want, they're not very keen to take over at this time. They know that there will be hard decisions that have to be taken, but I'm sure they'll be more rational, unlike this government, which has been absolutely irrational in the some of the decisions they're being. And also, just to give you another example, there's an Indian line of credit. India has been generous enough to give us a line of credit to import food and medicine. Our government, this government, is importing steel with that money. Then, in another example, uh, they are uh, planning to refleet the loss-making national airline. Uh, it has always been making losses, in, in, enormous losses. Mm. And now they're okay. planning to uh, lease out 24 planes or 21 planes. Uh, in the next few months, right. we don't have the money to do that. OK, Bhavani, I, I just want to concentrate for a minute or two on the man at the centre of this crisis, uh, Rajapaksa Gotabaya. Um, who is he? He was once known as the Terminator, the most feared man in Sri Lankan politics, the former leader of the military who brought about the defeat of the separatist Tamil Tigers in 2009. And how much power does he have? Uh, there are calls for the executive presidency to, to be abolished. Uh, can uh, and should that happen? Well, to start off with, we need to recognize the fact that President Gotabe Rajapaksa had no political elected office in, uh, experience when he came in in 2019. He was an administrator. He was a secretary to the Ministry of Defense and Urban Development. And he's identified as the architect of winning the war in 2009. And, and that record speaks to just not just the winning the war, but the violations associated with that and allegations of serious violations speaks to an individual who comes from a military background and did not care about due process, human rights, all of those concerns that many of us have been calling for for several years. Now, 2009, we saw that record and post-war, immediate post-war, there were very serious concerns of both violations, but also corruption, allegations, all of that. In 2019, um, very soon after the Easter Sunday attacks, which devastated Sri Lanka, there was this strong leader, the call for a strong leader. And coincidentally, uh, Gotabe Rajapaksa came out saying he's ready to be that leader and guide Sri Lanka back to security and stability and economic prosperity. And his campaign promise was uh, vistas of uh, prosperity and splendor. Now, fast forward two and a half years, there has been a complete disaster, a spectacularly disaster, where people are now starving. They do not uh, are able to get essential items. Medicine is in short supply. You don't really know what holds for people tomorrow. Now, in this disastrous uh, context, there's growing calls for his resignation, but also in terms of abolishing the executive presidency. Now, that call has been there for decades. Many of us have been making that call. But now it's picked up traction because people feel that the hardships they're facing is directly attributed to this one individual who wields so much power. And one dimension now we've just seen overnight where he has declared a state of emergency. That power is with the uh, executive president. But it's, it's a broad-based power. And in the past, Sri Lanka, we've seen emergency regulations being used to uh, crush dissent, go after critics, go after minorities. So he continues to wield a lot of power 
And the disasters, what we're seeing now is directly associated to him. So it's both the resignation of Kota Beraj Paksa, but also abolishing the office so that we do not see such repeats in the future. Ahilan, um, is Rajapaksa finished or do you think he's going to find a way to, to cling to power? Uh, could you foresee a situation uh, sometime in the future where Rajapaksa and members of his, uh, of his government end up in court? I think they are going to try to stay on in power as, as long as they can. Um, the, the mood in the country is to call for prosecutions against them for, uh, due to allegations of corruption. So they're going to try to drag this out as long as they can. And the longer they drag it out, it's going to be very painful for the country. Uh, the protests that we've seen in the last few weeks, they are unprecedented. Perhaps the only time we had protests of this order were way back in 1953, when we had the great uh, Hartal, when the entire country was shut down. And yesterday, we more or less saw the entire country uh, shut down with massive protests. Uh, these protests are not going to ease until uh, the Rajapaksas go home. But slowly, there is also a call um, to abolish the executive presidency, because while the Rajapaksas have really aggravated the situation. There are systemic problems, both with our economy and our politics. In 1978, we brought about the executive presidency. Until then, we were mainly a Westminster-style parliamentary system. And this has, time and again, uh, heaped huge amounts of powers in one individual. Uh, soon after uh, Gotabaya Rajapaksa came to power, and after the parliamentary elections, he brought about the 20th Amendment to the Constitution to heap further power. So abolishing the executive presidency is important. Similarly, way back in 1978, Sri Lanka liberalized its economy, and we started living beyond our means. We started importing everything. We decided to run our economy on debt. We are in a major debt crisis. Now, the, the worrying thing is that even if the Rajapaksas go, they're going to have to go sooner or later. They've completely lost legitimacy. We don't really see a path forward out of this crisis, even from the opposition. The only thing that the opposition has said, and now the government is also more or less taking the same position, and that is to go to the IMF for an IMF agreement, which might you know, provide some short-term credit, might you know, help us uh, restructure our debt, but that's only about rolling over our debt. What are we going to do in terms of a massive trade deficit? Now, Jahan mentioned the, uh, the tax cuts. Sri Lanka has had a, a budget deficit and uh, that needs to be reduced, but that means increasing taxes. But if we increase the value added tax, which is an indirect tax levied on all people, it's only going to increase the burden on the people who are already suffering. Now, the price of bread has doubled, the price of uh, petrol and diesel have doubled, the, even the price of rice has more or less doubled. So are we going to put more burden on them? But there's no thinking either from the opposition, none of the kind of uh, elite circles in Colombo about a process of redistribution so that the working people are able to face this crisis. Similarly, what are we going to do in the long term? Are we going to really try to mobilize agriculture? Jehan mentioned this major crisis in agriculture. Unless you provide relief to the farmers and mobilize them to start producing again, we are going to, we are, we are facing a very serious food crisis. We, we could be going into famine type of conditions in the next few years. But uh, right now the focus is on getting the Rajapaksas out, but people aren't thinking what we are going to be facing in the next year, two years, in terms of this, the consequences of this very serious crisis. Okay. Jihan, um, uh, uh, Ahilan was saying that he thinks that Roger Paxa will try to, to, to stay on. Um, he stands accused of overseeing war crimes. He came to power on the back of uh, this strongman reputation. And uh, we've been hearing about the Roger Paxas, of course, the family, uh, Sri Lanka's most powerful family dynasty. They've dominated politics in Sri Lanka for, for two decades. The opposition accuse him... Uh, President Rajapaksa and his government of corruption, of robbing the country and its people. Are they right? And, and what about the, the Rajapaksa dynasty? Are they now finished politically due to this crisis? At the present time, the, there is an unprecedented opposition to the Rajapaksa. It's amazing uh, to hear people shouting against 
the Rajapaksas, calling them rogues and telling them to go, that they want them to leave. This, this could not have been imagined uh, three months ago. Uh, but now the, the feeling of people, suddenly the opinion has come to people that the reason we are having this dollar shortage in the country is that the Rajapaksas have stolen the dollars. All the dollars have been stolen by them, which is not really fair because it's not only them that have led this country to this very sorry past. So anyway, the, the, the target of the anger of people is the Rajapaksas. So it's going to be very difficult for them to stay on. Uh, I agree with that. And uh, the question is, what type of exit strategy? Because they, they themselves are going to are feeling very insecure. There are all these allegations against them, ranging from the economic crimes uh, to the war crimes that you spoke about. Earlier, we didn't talk in this country much about war crimes because this that that polarizes our people because the the Sinhalese majority. Uh, who vote the Rajapaksas in, actually quite grateful to the Rajapaksas for having ended the war, for having won the war, for having ended the war. And they consider the price that was paid by the Tamil people to be worth it, which, of course, the Tamil people don't agree. The international community doesn't agree. The human rights groups don't agree with. But because they were so powerful, it was difficult to bring this issue up. But now people are talking quite openly about economic crimes. And along with economic crimes will come, I mean, now the association will come with war crimes, especially once they're out of power. Mm. So this is, this is something that we have to think about, uh, how to enable them to feel a little bit more secure in order to give up the power, which they need to give up, because we can't go on this way. Uh, there, there is no legitimacy in the government. The, a few days ago, the deputy speaker in parliament, he resigned. Then he, he's from the government side. Then he contested the election again in parliament and he won it. Hmm. And then the next day he resigned. So there is chaos within the government. Absolutely. This chaos will only stop if yeah. the if the Rajapaksas, if they resign and a new government is okay. constituted, preferably, hopefully, with all parties involved in it. Bhavani, I've got about a minute left on the, on the programme here, so I, I need a, a reasonably brief answer from you. Whatever happens uh, in, in the near term... Um, it's not good news for ordinary people in Sri Lanka, isn't it? That things are economically going to get worse before they get any better. Yes, Adrian, and that's the unfortunate thing. It's the, the people who are going to suffer the most. And we see that at the present moment, but uh, it's going to get much, much harder and there is no plan. But can I just also make this point? the resilience shown by the people, the fact that they've been coming to the streets, they were tear gas yesterday, the protests have been, regardless of the violence and the intimidation, people are coming out because the demand is very clear. Go home, go Tabea, go home, Rajapaksas is very clear. But that is only going to solve certain issues. We need to think about the long term, and that requires not just the, the opposition. It needs to be all stakeholders, but also communicating a plan. And I think that's something we can talk about, communicating and informing people what is in store okay. for the near future, but also the long term. Okay, there we must end it, I'm afraid. Many thanks indeed for being with us, uh, all of you. Uh, Bhavani Fonseca, Ahelan Karigama, and uh, Jihan Pereira. Uh, thank you for watching. Don't forget you can see the programme again at any time just by going to the website. That's at aljazeera.com. For further discussion, uh, go to our Facebook page. You'll find that at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And of course, you can join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle at AJ Inside Story. From me, Adrian Finnegan, and the whole team here in Doha. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again. Bye for now.